Well, it's official. The Met Office, with a mastery of understatement, says that April was a predominantly unsettled month. We'd certainly come to that conclusion ourselves, with almost every type of weather being seen here in West Lanx, from occasional frosty mornings, to heavy showers, to glorious sunshine. Perhaps the only thing we didn't have was snow. But what did all that mean for our solar generation? Did we hit our April target? In the first part of the video, I'll run through the numbers and answer those questions. After that, I'll give a couple of updates about our recent experiences with the system and also some news on a new tariff. Looking at the overall picture, we generated a total of 400 kilowatt hours in April with about 87% of that either used directly or stored to battery in roughly equal proportions. The amount we exported crept up to around 13%, just over double the figure in March. Our total consumption was 478 kilowatt hours, with around 71% coming from self-use or being pulled from the battery, leaving the remainder of around 29% being imported from the grid. Comparing the headline figures with those of March, we can see that April's generation was almost double, which doesn't seem too bad to me for what's been classed as an unsettled month. However, I'm a little surprised that our overall consumption in April has increased slightly over the March figure. I'd have probably expected it to be slightly lower, and don't really have an explanation for this. Maybe we've been leaving the immersion on by mistake. A comment which will only make sense if you've seen my previous video here. Looking at the month in detail, a couple of days are worth highlighting. On Wednesday the 5th, we struggled to generate just 4 kilowatt hours, with a consequent heavy draw of 10 kilowatt hours from the grid. Contrast that with Thursday the 20th, when we achieved our highest ever daily total so far of 23 kilowatt hours just above our previous best day of 22 kilowatt hours in August last year. Having watched a few other users' April solar updates, it seems these two dates were consistently poor and good respectively. The final point of note is the night between the 24th and 25th, when those nice weather people told us we should expect a frost. Having just put a fair amount of seedlings out into the greenhouse, mild panic set in. To avoid too much carnage, I rigged up a convector heater on an extension lead controlled by a smart plug. It managed to keep the frost off, but at the expense of around 7 kilowatt hours of grid power. The things you do for your tomatoes. The question then is, if April was so unsettled, how come we managed to generate almost twice what we did in March, with April becoming the second best month since we had the system installed in August last year? Well, despite the variable weather, it turns out that sunshine levels were close to normal expectations overall for April. As you can see from the chart, under the sun icon where we're located, sunshine levels were between 90 and 110% of the average, i.e. pretty much normal. It's interesting to see that in the northwest region of Scotland, they had a bumper April with figures in excess of 130% of average. Contrast that with the poor folks in the south and west who were anywhere up to 70% down on normal. Looking at what our projected output for April was, and then comparing that to the actual, we see our figure of 400 kilowatts was within 1.5% of the projection, which I guess just backs up what the weathermen were saying. Sunshine levels were pretty normal, at least in our region. Nine months into our solar journey, we're still utilising over 80% of our generation each month. That's direct self-usage and battery storage. As we move into the three peak solar months of May through July, the interesting thing for me will be whether this will continue or whether the amount we export, due to limited battery capacity, will exceed 20%. As would probably be expected, during April, we cross the equator, if I can use that term, representing the point at which the majority of our electricity is now coming from solar rather than grid imports. This should continue through to September-October, if last year is anything to go by. Updating our record of solar value, both consumed and exported, we can see that we added around £135 to the total, bringing it to £600 over the past nine months. 
Projecting forwards for the remaining three months, our annual output is projected to be around 3,380 kilowatt hours, with a total value of £1,049. This is marginally ahead of the initially projected output from the PV GIST tool. Let's keep our fingers crossed for some extra sunny days in the coming summer to boost those figures up even more. I initially wondered whether to include this slide, as there's a lot of information on it. The key point I wanted to highlight is the clear downward trend in our grid electricity consumption since we had solar installed. The question seemingly continually asked is, will solar pay back? Well, in my mind, the answer is clear. Yes, it will. The payback period will be different for each individual person, depending on the nature of your system, how much you paid for it, and where you live. But payback it will. Or does anyone still think otherwise? Now, in the words of Monty Python, for something completely different. Rather than yet more boring text headings for my slides, and to check you're all still awake after all those figures, what we have here is a cheesy stab at Pictionary. OK, you've had a couple of seconds. Time's up. The first one is, of course, Solis Cloud has been a bit flaky. In nine months of using Solis Cloud, both on the web and the mobile app, I'd probably have to summarise the experience as patchy. Most of the time, I can usually get the information I want, and in particular, the daily and monthly totals. However, as discussed in my six-month review, see video here, we've experienced interrupted data feeds and multiple maintenance updates. One of the least satisfactory features is the supposed instantaneous view of what the system is doing, i.e. the energy flows to from the solar panels, grid, inverter, battery and house demand. The figures in this view have always appeared a bit suspect to me and inconsistent with what's displayed on the inverter LCD panel at the time, something which drives my wife nuts. I'd mainly put this down to sampling update interval and time lags between Solis Cloud and the inverter, but in the most recent maintenance update it almost seemed like Solis were doing development on a live system, with an additional circle and information being displayed for a while before disappearing again. Unfortunately, I didn't have the presence of mind to take a screenshot, so hence the vague description. More generally, the mobile app seems to have a number of limitations, especially when compared to something like the Give Energy app, as recently reviewed by Danny V. Solar in his video, link in the description. One feature which I would really consider worthwhile adding would be the ability to track battery state of charge, especially in the light of some other developments I'll talk about in a minute or two. Anyhow, enough morning at Solis, on to the next one. This one's easy though, Alarm 2015. See, told you it was cheesy. Again, as discussed in my six month review, we'd been experiencing multiple Alarm Code 2015 messages being issued by the Solis inverter, with nine instances between August 2022 and the middle of April. Well, no sooner had I published that video than we had another three in the space of a week in each case coinciding with the batteries reaching 100% charge. The system still recovers automatically within a very short period and then operates as normal, but this continuing issue was becoming a little more concerning. So I logged a call ticket with Solis support, and fair dues they responded within 48 hours with a request to remotely troubleshoot and make any necessary settings changes. And within the next 24 hours, I get a firmware upgraded and settings done message. To be honest, I was more than a bit disappointed because my support call was very much geared around asking if they could explain what they thought the issue might be, rather than just jumping in and changing things. Of course, I hadn't had the presence of mind to note down all the settings and firmware version beforehand, so I don't know what was changed. But in any case, it hasn't resolved the problem with another three instances in the last 10 days or so. I've been trolling the web for any clues and I've read that this type of alarm may relate to the batteries not being in balance, but the post wasn't for the exact same equipment as I have, so I don't know how accurate that is. Hence, we're not much further forward. I'll keep you updated. 
And of course, everyone should get the last one. I finally dived in, taken the plunge, and signed up to Octopus Flex. I've been umming and ahhing for a few weeks now, my main concern being that my battery capacity at 7 kilowatt hours might not be large enough to really benefit from this tariff. However, after having a bit of a tinker with an early version of Gary Does Solar's modelling utility, link in the description below, and feedback from a number of people posting comments, thanks especially to Tim in Wigan, it seemed like there was no reason to hold back any longer. Already being with Octopus, the signing up process was pretty straightforward, and we've switched over in a few hours. For now, I've just configured the inverter to import during the early morning flux rate so that I can see how that goes before experimenting with any timed export during the evening peak rate. Of course, this is all going to make my ongoing solar value calculations a bit more involved. But what else would I be doing with my time? I'll keep you updated on how it goes. Well, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. And please do like, comment and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Cheers and hope to see you again next time.